My name is Andre Taylor. I am the oral historian here at William & Mary. And I want to thank you all for this kickoff event tonight for the exhibit, Strolling, A History of Black Greek Metal Organizations at William & Mary. So I'm happy to see the D9 out here. I'm happy to see administration out here, family, friends. Uh, so I'm very appreciative of everybody's uh, presence here this evening. So this exhibit uh, is a big part of something that my mom for years, years ago told me, I can show you better than I can tell you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was upstairs in the library, and there was a student who walked up to me, and she says, oh, what is that you're wearing? And I said, well, these are my Greek letters. And she says, oh, what organization? I said, I'm a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I didn't give it incorporation day, but I am incorporated. Uh, <laughs> and she says, I didn't know that there were black fraternities and sororities. As an educator, a lifelong educator, as a person who is interested in history, it was an obligation of mine to not only tell her the story, but to show her the story. The exhibit, as, you, as many of you have seen already, uh, when you walk through, each of the Divine Nine banners are up. Now, this campus has not had the Brothers of Iota Phi Theta Incorporated as of yet, but they are still part of the D9 and very much so represented. As you walk through, each, each panel has an oral history QR code associated with them. So you're not hearing my story. You're hearing the stories of the people who were initiated here at William & Mary. It is an honor and a privilege to see the majority of those people who I interviewed tonight in attendance. So if you were one of the people who were interviewed and your oral history is upstairs, please stand up. Since the summer, I've been collecting oral histories, um, collecting artifacts, and doing what I needed to do to make this come to fruition. So for all of the efforts from everyone who's helped with this, um, I appreciate you all. One person in particular, uh, Jenny Davy. Are you here, Jenny? Jenny Davy is the director of exhibits here at William & Mary, and every step of the way, she was present, she was teaching, she was motivating, she was uplifting, she was moving forward. She's not the only person that helped, but directly for me, uh, it was a big help. I saw a very tremendous round of applause for her. For her. <laughs> so now, this, looking at this audience right now, you are also examples of people who can show me better than you can tell. By your mere presence here tonight, hopefully there's going to be more uh, inclusion here at William & Mary. Uh, this is an open library, so this isn't just the William & Mary students, it's the William & Mary community. Come in, take, take, take out books, uh, partake in uh, activities, and just be part of the community. Because as of now, as of before, as of always, you all are part of this community. So now I'm going to introduce Carrie Cooper, who is the Dean of Libraries here at William & Mary, and she will introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you all very much for coming out. Before I introduce our guest tonight, um, I just want to take a moment to publicly thank Dre for his vision and for bringing us all Dre. to the Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Carrie, and I'm the Dean of University Libraries, and it's really an honor to be here with all of you. Gregory Parks is the Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives and Professor of, and professor of Law at Wake Forest University School of Law. He has an MS in Forensic Psychology from the City University of New York, an MA and a PhD in Clinical Psychology from the University of Kentucky, and a JD from Cornell University. His research focuses on the intersection of race and law, as well as social science and law, including the ways that the law addresses racial bias. His scholarship also focuses on black fraternal networks and their relation to the law. Professor Parks has authored and edited nearly 10 scholarly books including 12 Angry Men, True Stories of Being a Black Man in America Today, The Obamas in a Post-Racial America, and Alpha Phi Alpha, A Legacy of Greatness, The Demands of Transcendence. Prior to joining the faculty at Wake Forest, he practiced in trial group in the DC office of McDermott, Will, and Emory. 
He has also been a visiting fellow at Cornell Law School and a law clerk on both the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and the D.C. Court of Appeals. He is an active member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity and served as national chair of its Commission on Racial Justice. Please welcome Dr. Gregory Parks. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Brother Taylor, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the wonderful staff here at uh, William and Mary uh, for, uh, for bringing me here and, and all the support and all that you do on behalf of the students here at the university. And thank you to the members of the Divine Nine community for coming out and more importantly for the work that you do in our communities and especially so to the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha. Um, <laughs> One other thing about my biography I think is important to add. I, I, undergrad, I went to the mecca of black higher education, Howard University. <laughs> uh, I think that's important to mention. If you'll forgive me just a little bit, um, so I had a certain uh, presentation prepared, and, and some of you know we had an explosion uh, at, at a, uh, I didn't even know, we had a fertilizer factory in, in Winston-Salem. Um, so it shut down the university and, and nobody could get back on campus. This is uh, based on a, a talk I gave a few years ago uh, at another institution, uh, largely to faculty, so I'm going to try to not make this overly academic and more conversational. Um, and I want to leave ample time for a conversation with you all. So, I mean, you know that I, I wrote this book with my Phi Beta Sigma friend and colleague, Matthew Huey, A Pledge with Purpose. We wanted to talk about the legacy of Divine Nine organizations uh, and their work in the area of racial uplift, community service, philanthropy, civic activism, shaping public policy, and uh, a, a little, a lot of, uh, and um, the work that they did and, and, and sort of begged the question, what's the future? Um, and I think that's even more important in the day in w in days and time in which we live. But we wanted to give some context to the organizations and with that said, uh, let me proceed. All right, so what do we know about fraternities and sororities? If you're not a member <laughs> of the Divine Nine uh, and someone uh, tells you they're in a fraternity or sorority, I, I, I think this is what you typically think of. For the young folks in, a, in the room, you have no idea what Revenge of the Nerds is. <laughs> um, but it's one of the classic movies on fraternities and sororities. You would typically think that we are all about socialization, uh, socializing and partying and having fun and a lot of ruckus. And, and we might party a little bit, but as Alpha say, we party hard, we stay up late, but most of all, we graduate, we scholars making dollars. <laughs> if you know a little bit about um, Divine Nine organizations, you might know that like other fraternities and sororities, we have our own sets of challenges. Uh, and what most in the room, if you're familiar with my writing, or my brothers in the room, if you're familiar with my emails, <laughs> um, you know that as organizations, we have real challenges in any number of areas. Um, challenges that I think are important for us to be mindful of mainly because organizations with challenges that they can't effectively grapple with, it undermines their ability to do the kind of outward facing work that they are committed to doing. If it's a company, it's serving your customers. If it's a membership based uh, organization, it's the kind of work that you do to uplift the community. So this is a challenge, but it isn't the entire story about our organizations. And for the young people, you have no idea what school days is. <laughs> but, you should, but you should watch it. Um, so the book, A Pledge with Purpose, is about racial uplift. And the way that we would typically think about organized racial uplift is thinking about mainline civil rights organizations or community-based uh, and philanthropic organizations. You might think of the NAACP. Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Congress of Racial Equality, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, organizations that 100% of their work is focused on civil rights, 
civic engagement, social justice. And our story is a little bit more complicated. So I'll skip over that. I'll skip over that. Who are we as organizations? The way I often think about us as organizations is that we are the product of a confluence of factors that fed into a group of men and women at the turn of the 20th century by and large and also in 1963 that influenced the way that they thought about the world and shaped how they thought about uplifting the race. Now among the things that influenced us as W.E.B. Du Bois said is the first black American or first Negro institution and that is the black church. The black church a space in which African Americans could come together in a spirit of faith, a commitment to shared ideals beyond blood, rooted in shared commitment to those values, being a better person, supporting one another, supporting one's community. The second would be um, black secret societies. Whether you talk about the Masons, the Odd Fellows, the Elks, among the things that these organizations were rooted in was a development and sustaining of fictive kinship ties, connecting people who weren't blood relatives on a shared set of values, among them being a better person and being a good brother or sister. At the turn of the 20th century, some of it was about uplifting our communities. And we know, if we think about the black church, many if not all of the founders of divine nine organizations were men and women of faith, by and large Christian. We know that a number of the founders of the fraternities were members of black secret societies. We know that many of their parents were members of these organizations. And among the other things that black secret societies gave these individuals was a sense of ritual and a sense of brotherhood or sisterhood that transcended time and space and that was not bound to a college campus. And then we come to what um, <coughs> noted historian Rayford Logan, uh, Howard University history professor, one of Alpha Phi Alpha's former general presidents, what he described as the nadir or the low point of race relations in America. That period between Reconstruction and the early 20th century where you saw a rise in the Ku Klux Klan, lynchings of blacks in the south, uh, sundown towns in the north, uh, obstruction to and opposition to the passage and implementation of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. It is important to keep in mind this period in time because in some ways I feel like the times we're in reflect that period. And so you had men and women who were college students creating organizations in the midst of this experience as one of Alpha Phi Alpha's founders, Henry Arthur Callis, once said, Alpha Phi Alpha was born in the shadows of slavery and on the lap of disenfranchisement. And I suspect that reverberates across the other organizations, certainly those founded at the turn of the 20th century, which I think shaped the way that they thought about the world. And as college educated, young men and women, their obligations to our communities. Callis also said that Alpha Phi Alpha, um, that society offered us narrowly circumscribed opportunity 
and no security. Out of our need, our fraternity brought social purpose and social action. Not surprisingly, Callis was inspired to found a fraternity by the work that was going on the year before he was a student at Cornell called the Niagara Conference and the work of W.E.B. Du Bois and his colleagues in building the precursor to the NAACP. And Callis said, I want to create a fraternity that, does the, that, uh, that uses college men to do similar work that the NAACP or then the Niagara Conference was doing. Then you had predominantly, at the time, completely white fraternities. Um, we know that a number of students, black students at Cornell who later on founded Alpha Phi Alpha, and don't worry, this ain't gonna be all about Alpha Phi Alpha, all right? <laughs> It's going to be a lot about Alpha Phi Alpha, but not all about Alpha Phi Alpha. So they worked at fraternity houses, white fraternity houses. And I think what they gathered from these groups was fictive kinship ties rooted in the college experience, the notion of what a collegiate fraternity could and should look like, and fun. A group of guys or women who, who have a sense of shared values, to be better people, to uplift their communities, to make the world a better place. But as the young folks would say, someone or a group of folks to also just kick it with <laughs> and enjoy their company. Also, you had um, as precursors to collegiate fraternities, and sororities, collegiate literary societies. Early American higher education was rooted in rote memorization and regurgitation of information. The value that literary societies brought to their college campuses was a spirit of debate, debate intellectualism, high-mindedness, broader reading. Quite often the literary societies, especially in the Northeast, had larger libraries than their, the uni universities where they were, were guests. And so what I think these organizations, Divine Nine organizations took away from literary societies was to not simply be a good student and get good grades, but to be curious. And those can be two different things. Um, the way I think that it fed into the other elements of these organizations and what they would go on to do is how do you take a group of young men and women who will grow older, who are college educated, who, are ed uh, who learn not simply what's in books but what's in life and take that talent and try to make the world a better place for those who didn't have the same opportunities as they did especially to go to college. And then this is blank, I must have deleted the slide, but there are two slides here. Cornell and the Mecca, Howard University. The institutional factors that influence these young men and women. So you have two different kinds of institutions, right? You have predominantly white institutions, Cornell University, Indiana University, Butler University. The dynamics that black students experienced at those institutions then, and ironically in many ways still to the, today, is a, a spirit or a feeling of isolation, a lack of connection, even though you're at the place. There's a, a woman who wrote a history of, the, uh, of early African Americans at Cornell University, and the title is Apropos, Part and Yet Apart. You're there but you're not fully connected to the institution. Back then, couldn't play sports because you couldn't come into physical contact with white students. Where the universities had university housing, you couldn't live in that housing. You lived in the community with community folk and stayed connected with those community members. And then you had Howard University. Howard that sought to be the black Harvard University, or as I would say, Harvard the white Howard University, <laughs> where the black elite 
sent their children to be educated by largely black professors, if we're mindful of the times and racial segregation where the most brilliant black professors, they could not teach at white institutions. They might have been educated at Yale or Harvard or William & Mary, but they were not going to be able to teach at such institutions. So they went back to HBCUs. Even in the early 20th century, you had institutions like Howard where black history was being taught. And there was a spirit of, uh, to steal the, the motto of the black women's club movement, lifting as we climb. Black people from wealthy families who wanted to go on to be physicians and attorneys and school teachers and professors, but who realized they had an obligation to their broader community. So with all of this, what does it tell you about Divine Nine organizations? My sense of what we are or is, are intended to be are organizations about personal excellence. Some of that's about academic achievement, but that goes beyond getting good grades. It means being intellectually curious beyond what you're being taught in your class, wanting to engage intellectually with others, I think it has implications for professional excellence as well. Being the best person and human being that you can be. Second, I think it's about the development and sustaining of fictive kinship, times, uh, time, uh, fictive kinship ties across time and space. Being a brother with the brothers or a sister with sisters with whom you came through in an individual chapter, members of that chapter back in time, forward in time, and other members across the country and the globe. I think it means being deeply committed to our communities and trying to make a world a better place for them. And over time, that means different things as different issues arise and as different tools become available to us in the fight for making the world a better place. And implicit in all of that behind the scenes, I think, is making sure the organizations are self-perpetuating, meaning the issues arise over time that threaten the very existence of the organizations. And if you want to be a collective that does good work in the world and in your communities, you've got to make sure the organization's around 10, 20, 100 years from now. So you've got to address the internal dynamics that threaten the viability of the, the organizations. So you get this narrative of black excellence. And the thing I'd like to talk about isn't the full book, but it's the chapter that I thought was most important in the book because I think it sets up a, um, a template for how we should be today, especially today. So individually, during the early part of the 20th century, each of the, at least then, um, eight fraternities and sororities had national programs that they were working on to effectuate change in their communities. Early on, it, it was how do you get kids, as Alpha would say, from high, sc uh, uh, high school to college? How do you ensure that African Americans understand the importance of the franchise, the ability to exercise their right to vote? During the Great Depression is how do you help individuals who are poor and destitute survive? 1940s rolls around, 19, late 1930s, 1940s. For me as a lawyer, I always say this is the new tool. Black folks start going to law school. Um, recognizing the sexism therein because it was largely black men being admitted to law school and now we had a new tool at our disposal. Not simply could we educate 
folks about their right to vote and why it's important to vote, we could use the law to ensure that that franchise was protected. We didn't simply need to talk about the benefits of integration. We could use the law to force integration. But if we step back a little, a little bit, 1938, importantly, Alpha Kappa Alpha starts their first civil rights collective with a lobbying arm in Washington, D.C., titled the Nonpartisan Council. And that group lasted from 1938 to 1948. And then in 1948, the question was, could we be more effective if we were united with the other, uh, at the time, great eight organizations? So they put a call out to the other organizations. And all of the sororities came on board. Alpha Phi Alpha came on board, Kappa Alpha Psi, Phi Beta Sigma came on board, but I think about three years in, they stepped away. Omega Psi Phi never came aboard, but probably for rational reasons. They said, a lot of the civil rights organizations are being led by members of Omega Psi Phi. We feel like the work we'd be doing is redundant. But the other groups, the six of them, thought there's something here. So they came together as a collective and created the American Council on Human Rights. So when we think about the uh, nonpartisan council, among the things that they focused on, which was replicated by the American, uh, 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 the American Council on Human Rights, were uh, coalition building grassroots work. How do we create uh, collective chapters of our organizations that serve like field offices the way you might think of in the NAACP? And they focused on issues like anti-discrimination, education, health care, fair housing, racial integration, labor equity, and voting rights. Then we get to the American Council on Human Rights. It had an office in Washington, D.C. Ms. Gray was, I think, secretary. Elmer Henderson uh, was the executive director. Patricia Roberts was a staff member, all D9 members. Collectively, the organizations funded it. They paid into it. They made sure they had paid staff not simply a volunteer organization. And the goal here was to provide a joint and cooperative nonpartisan body through which together the member organizations may one, study questions of domestic and foreign policy and legislation as they affect civil ri civic rights and human relationship. And two, develop and use procedures and means whereby it may best express its opinion on such questions and seek to have enacted, administered, and enforced the law effectuating the same. Um, one of the focal points of the ACHR was member and community education. They did this through a number of means. One is they had a regular newsletter that came out. Congress and Equality, the national organs or magazines of the respective organizations ran articles to educate their own members. They put out a political action handbook. And often what these things were I always chuckle when I think about this one, how a bill becomes a law, because I think about Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> Young folks in here know nothing about it. <laughs> but the goal was to educate our communities about the legislative process at the federal level so that they can be educated, informed, and engaged citizens. 
Um, within the newsletter, Congress and Equality and other outlets, they kept members of the community abreast of the bills that were before Congress that were important to our community. Second, grassroots efforts. Uh, among the things they did was to um, uh, a letter writing campaign and telegraphing. We don't telegraph anymore, but um, getting members of the organizations and members of our community to reach out to their federal representatives, express their concerns about what kind of legislation was being passed or what needed to be passed, mass meetings and forums, locally but also in Washington, D.C., workshops and small conferences, testimonies at open hearings before Congress, and, various, and in various venues, finding ways to educate our community verbally, not simply in written form. Philanthropy. They used their money to help fund Freedom Riders in the South. And in addition, litigation. They funded litigation and members litigated in federal courts up to the U.S. Supreme Court on behalf of these organizations collectively and the ACHR specifically. Two important cases, Henderson v. U.S. was the case that desegregated U.S. public railways. Uh, Elmer Henderson was the plaintiff in that case. The two lawyers uh, flanking him on the left would be, from my alphas in the room, Belford v. Lawson, um, one of Alpha's uh, past general presidents. He litigated the case from the U.S. District Court, Federal Trial Court, all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and he was also, at the time, the general counsel of Alpha Phi Alpha. And then to the right of Mr. Henderson is John Sandifer, who, um, after Belford Lawson, he became general counsel of the fraternity. And he went on to become a, a, a New York State judge thereafter. And then you have Bowling v. Sharp, which, um, in this case, they wrote an amicus brief, which would have enforced uh, a Brown v. Board of Education in Washington, D.C., because Washington, D.C. technically is not a state, right? So among the issues that they focused on, especially in the context of advocating before Congress and putting pressure on the executive branch the Office of the President, were employment discrimination, especially in the federal government, um, discrimination in integrating the military, fair housing, and a range of other, of other issues. Abolishing the poll tax, as I know, integrating the military, school desegregation, federal aid for minority scholarships. So what does it mean for the organizations today, right? So um, Dr. Huey and I basically end the book after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act. And one thing that we say in there is, if you look at the national magazines of all the fraternities and sororities, or their D9, or their history books, the social justice work really ended in the late 60s. Doesn't mean they didn't continue to do good work. The social justice work ended. And we asked why. So sociologists study um, social movements. And we know with social movements that when they believe that they've achieved their goal, they either die out or they repurpose. And these organizations weren't going to die out. So they repurposed, right? With the advancement of affirmative action in the 70s, we speculate that these organizations said, well, what else? We came, we saw, we conquered. What else 
could we do? Well, we should help some kids go to college and provide them with some scholarships. We should go read to some kids. And those are all important things, especially if you feel like the big hurdles that we face have been overcome. Hindsight being 2020, I think we realize those hurdles were not overcome. And also, I think we should recognize that where there is progress, there's always retrenchment. Where there's advancement, there are always folks who want to push back on that advancement. The same way you saw the end of slavery and the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, you saw people wanting to take their country back. Take it back from people they thought didn't deserve it and take it back to a time that was more suitable for them. We are in those times today. And for me, the important thing about this book isn't really the history that we're looking at. The important thing for me is it begs the question, what are we going to do today, collectively, to address threats to democracy, to address threats to our ability to walk down the street or go for a run or take a drive and come home alive. We've got real challenges before us. Collectively, our organizations have some of the most brilliant, talented, committed, and wealthy black folks in this country. And I believe that it is time for us as a collective to get serious about the threats at our door and the challenges that our communities and our country face. So that's our story with the book. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, really quickly, if anyone in this room has a question, I've got a mic here for you. Got it. I want to apologize to you, brother, for asking this question, but not saying that Howard is the Mecca, but what, what do you think it says about the, uh, the I guess it's the bomb, the, uh, whatever is going on now, I guess with the historically black colleges that have been seen, bomb the threats. bomb threats. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think that says about the times that we're living in or yeah, I'll just tell you. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with the bomb threats. I don't know what those individuals or that individual is thinking. But I do know we're living in some precarious times. Um, all right, let me just talk straight. <laughs> Donald Trump's election <laughs> wasn't the source, but it certainly is a symptom. It reflects that, yeah, there are some Americans who say, I'm supporting this approach because uh, there are certain policy goals that I want to see. I get that. But there are a lot of folks, our fellow countrymen and women, who say, I'm supporting this approach because he hates the people that I hate too. And I think his election gave folks who had to say things in private that they didn't want to have to say in private or things that were in their heart that they didn't just want to keep in their heart the liberty to speak and the liberty to act on. So I would not be surprised if the bomb threats at HBCUs over the past two days was at least part and parcel of that story. Which means, again, we've got real threats. I don't mean simply folks who don't want you to vote. It's folks who don't want you to live. And the collective can be more effective than the individual. I mean, that's the very essence of fraternity, right? Or sorority. It's that the group can get things done better 
then an island can get those things done. And the question for me is, will we move from rhetoric to the kind of action that's needed to advance right our communities and, and um, the good that's in this country? Yes, ma'am. You bring up some very good points. But being a grandmother, I have a grandson coming forward. What can we do to help as a society bridge stronger, to help these young black boys as they're growing up and proceeding? I know the Greeks are out there, but what are we going to do? Because it's starting way down in kindergarten where our young black boys are being pushed down and being told that you're not as good as the others. And we can't go back to segregation, you know? So what are we going to do to keep them proud young men? Like years ago, you know, we were raised up proud from kindergarten. That's how our generation made it so far. So what's going to happen with the young black boys of today? I mean, the girls too. But young black boys are really being hit hard. What can we do? Two points. You know, the precarious place that we find ourselves in is that there are many who decry segregation, but they don't want integration. They, they sit in school with us. They sit on the school board. They want a narrative of this country taught to our children that ain't true. They don't want the full story told. They don't want the story told because I think it's less about our children, and this isn't a full answer to your question, but I'm gonna get to it in a second. It's about their children. And it's not about protecting them. It's about their eyes becoming open in a society that's becoming increasingly brown and black, and they, they see the numbers are just not on their side. So what happens when their kids or their grandkids say, America isn't all that you said it was, but we could make it what you said it was, but I got to go align with these people over here to do that kind of work. And I think that's what worries them. The reason I say that is because I think back to when I was in an Alpha alumni chapter in, a, in, a, in a, another region. One thing we did is we had what, what I called Saturday school. And it was a wraparound mentoring program for what I'd say at-risk black boys. And the reason I put it that way is because I think too often the work we do as organizations is with kids like our own. Mm -hmm. Middle class, upper middle class kids who we want to have a debutante ball or a cotillion or a cotillion for, they're going to be all right for the most part, at least academics and getting into college. There are folks who are more vulnerable who need our work and service. And so I would say to the organizations, whether they be D9 or other organizations, if you want to create a bulwark against the threats against our young people, you've got to engage them in a way that we rarely engage them. You've got to provide them with the kind of support, education, training that they will not get in school so that they will have the kind of self-esteem that's necessary to propel them through life. But on top of that, and just as, if not more important, so I remember when I was Alpha's National Chair of its Commission on Racial Justice, and some of the leadership said, we want to just focus on mentoring. I said, it's hard to mentor kids when police shoot them down in the street. <laughs> so it's got to be a both and, right? It's got to be helping young brothers and sisters have the confidence, have the tools, have the skill set necessary to propel them through life. But as grandparents and parents and aunts and uncles and mentors, we've also got to fight the good fight on the school board and before the city council and before the state legislature and before Congress. We've got to not only vote, we've got to recognize that for example, the biggest thing that a president of the United States can do isn't get elected and sign bills. As a lawyer, I always say, is who he or she puts on courts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whether it be the Supreme Court, 
or any other federal court, those judges will sit there for 40 or 50 years, effectuating policy in ways in which the average citizen will never pay attention to. But we've got to pay attention. We've got to vote. We've got to get our voice out there. We've got to mobilize folks and energize folks. And I always say, get in where you can fit in. For some people, you know, some of my law students ask me, what can I do? I'm going to a big law firm and I'm going to make $200,000 a year, but I'm going to be working 80 hours a week. I said, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund can use some of that money. You might not have the time to go do X, but you have the resources to do Y. So do, do what you can. If you've got time, run for office. Go serve on the, uh, the school board. Go serve on the city council. Three, if your place is in the streets, mobilizing, direct action, let that be your place too. And for D9 organizations, what I would say is we have to find a way to bring all of those pieces to the puzzle. We cannot afford to be scared of the more radical youth in our midst and in our organizations. We have to find a way to harness that and channel it for the broader good in our community. Other questions? How do you address the crime that's in our neighborhoods? The, the young um, black males, just yesterday I listened to a report of a 15-year-old, a shootout at a tennis shoe store. Um, so how do we begin to address the crimes in our neighborhood that are against ourselves? Yeah, good question. It's been a while since I read criminology research, but from what I remember, the two biggest predictors of crime reduction are educational opportunity and job opportunities. And so to the extent that we want to help reduce crime in our communities, we need to align with organizations and institutions that are trying to provide those kinds of resources. The third thing I'd say is, to your question, some of our young people are just lost. Mm -hmm. They grow up in homes that are broken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't see the kind of either parental generally, or for young men, maybe father figures in their home who can guide them. Um, often they're frustrated. They may not know where the roots of that frustration lies. And so, if we want to do the work of making our communities better, like I said, we can't afford to simply do cotillions of botillions. Mm -hmm. We can't afford to simply give a few thousand dollars to a kid who's already going to go to college, um, a few extra dollars for book money. Mm -hmm. We can't afford to be scared of our brothers and sisters and avoid going and working with some of the harder young brothers and sisters in our community. I know a, a brother of mine who has a, uh, a program through his alumni chapter where he works with young men in prison so that they are equipped for the world when they get out. So we can't be scared. I'm not saying go to a hood in the middle of the night. <laughs> I'm standing on the corner and say, how can I be helpful? <laughs> but we got to stop running from the tougher aspects of our communities. Um, and I think that's a path. And also, to the heart of this discussion, we can't do it alone. Um, we can't do it alone in isolation as a chapter in a given city. We can't do it alone as an individual organization. D9 organizations collectively should find ways to work together in a city across the board, nationally and internationally. And we've got to find other organizations outside the D9 to work in solidarity with. Whether they be other civil rights organizations, whether they be community-based organizations, whether they be non-black fraternity and sorority organizations, whether they be the black church, we've got to find ways to create a sense of community and collaboration to address 
to your point, some of the more difficult challenges in our communities. Thank you. So um, I have a question from the chat sure. for the remote viewers. So um, Rashad H. has asked, uh, how does a college student de determine which organization to join? Can you also talk to reasons why? <laughs> I say go pick up Lawrence Ross's Vine out. There you go. An overview of, of various organizations. I'd say if you want to read about the legacy of the groups, you can pick up Walter Kimbrough's Black Group 101. Yes. Educate yourself um, on what the organizations do, their aims, what fits your personality. If you are brilliant, Remarkably good looking. <laughs> also realize you're going to join a chapter. And so you have to ask yourself, what are the young men on that campus like? Because you'll be connected with them for the rest of your life. And so these are the kind of guys who you want to show up to their wedding and have them come to yours and be there when their mom passes away at the funeral and sit back 50 years later laughing about something that happened some night 50 years before. Um, and, you know, it's a very individual decision. And then ask yourself, what can you bring to the table? Um, don't see it as a short-term experience, meaning while it's a very important experience at the collegiate level, prayerfully, you'll continue to, the organization will pour into you and make you a better person, and prayerfully, you will bring your talents to the table on behalf of the organization to make it and our communities better over a lifetime, and you gotta ask yourself which organization fits best with that objective. <laughs> anyone, else have, anyone else have a question in, in this room? Oh, we've got a big one in the chat. All right. So, one of your law. This says, Brother Parks. How well prepared are D9 organizations to engage a university climate where the once traditional categories of men and women are increasingly blurry or rejected? How long can a brotherhood or sisterhood survive before it's not keeping pace with how, in terms of gender, students are identifying themselves? It seems like an important question, in part because D9 has always stood for progressive change and for advancing the cause of those who are resisting exclusionary and divisive ways of life. William and Mary and former Rhodes Scholar, Andrew Zwatt. Um, we're not ready. Um, the, 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 the movie about Biggie Small at the end, he says, we can't change the world, world unless we change ourselves. I think D9 organizations are good at looking outward and asking how can we help make the world a better place. I think like many organizations or many people, it's difficult for them to look inward and ask what are our real challenges and how do we deal with them. Um, and grappling with the notion of who's a male and female, a man or woman, and what that means for membership. I think by and large the organizations do not want to grapple with it um, and to their detriment because time is moving on and I think whether they want transgender members or not, for example, 
there are transgender members of the organizations. And without grappling with it, they set no set of policies. They don't think through what it's going to mean when they have transgender members. Um, they don't know how to navigate the space. Um, and I think maybe even more importantly, it's hard to be a person, I'll say this honestly, it's hard to be a member of a D9 organization and want real change in your own organization. Um, just like in our society, there are people who are committed to the country. There are those who engage in blind allegiance, who love the country, think that there's not much wrong with it, and resent anybody who brings up the fact that there are blemishes. And then there are those who engage in constructive allegiance or um, patriotism, who love the country, but who want us to be honest about its blemishes so that we can correct them. And it's the same in any organization. I think the members who want to grapple with the most difficult issues that face the organization are on the sidelines, or they're inactive. And if we want to find a way to ensure that our organizations last and become even more impactful in the lives of their own members and in our communities, we've got to find a way to give voice to those who want to grapple with the difficult issues like Brother Zawaki just raised. Got quiet on that one. <laughs> Anyone else in here? Um, what can colleges and universities do to help, what can colleges and universities do to help to keep the D9 organizations on their campuses and active? Because we know membership is waning on a whole lot of campuses now. And what can the universities do to help keep the D9 alive and active? Um, put their money where their mouth is. <laughs> recruit and bring more black students to their campuses um, beyond the athletes. Um, two, it would be help the organizations on their campus become more strategic about how they brand and market themselves to attract best students to their ranks. And that goes beyond black students. I mean, ironically, Brother Zawaki is a white brother, right? Um, if I can, Brother Zawaki, I'm going to give you a story. So he came to William and Mary, early 90s. He came here, he ran track. And from what I remember from the story, he said, I, you know, there are a group of young men on the track team who wanted to join this particular fraternity. I just, I was like, why join a fraternity? And then there were upper level students who were in a fraternity. They were good athletes. They were academically inclined. And they were always doing community service. And he said, that's, that's not what I thought a fraternity was, but Maybe this is something for me too. The other young men who wanted to join said, no, 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 this isn't what you want to do. <laughs> but they finally did it together. Which suggests that, yes, we are historically and predominantly black Greek led organizations. But when a young, white, Latino, Asian, Native American, man or woman, shows up and care about the issues that we care about. <clears throat> they want to fight for a better world in the way that we want to fight for it. They want to understand in a nuanced way dynamics of race. This should be a welcome place for them too. Um, and then we've got to do our part as members long before, and as, as family members as well, long before our young people get to campus, because quite often, young brothers and sisters get to campus, they may not want to join any kind of organization. 
If they do, it might not be a black organization. Um, and if we want these kinds of organizations to be the thing that's on their radar, we've got to live a life that demonstrates why it's a valuable kind of organization. I know a, I know a judge in DC, in Alpha, who was inactive. His, his twin sons went off to college. They came back as captives. <laughs> and he broke down crying. <laughs> and they said, why are you crying? You're not active. <laughs> you don't even talk about all. Why would we join it? It doesn't seem like it means that much to you. So there, there are responsibilities that I think we should put on the university, but we've got to take some onus that we want to increase our ranks. We've got to be out there. We've got to be visible. We've got to be engaged. We've got to educate our community about what we are, who we are, and what we do. We've got to show young people why it's valuable to be a member of our organization. When we have debutante balls and cotillions and uh, botillions, we can't just give a few thousand dollars to a young man or woman and say good luck in college. We got to call the brothers and sisters on that campus and say, one of my bows or uh, Debs is at your school. We need you to, honestly, we need you not to brutalize that person. We need you to look out for them, make sure they do well academically, get them acclimated to the campus. And then we should pray that the young man or woman who we sow seeds in to be the best person they can be will say, damn, I want to be just like those people who invested in me. You just. <laughs> Are we done? More uh, questions? I was going to say we have time for one more question. and. Uh, then we can, if people who haven't seen exhibit, we can go upstairs, but uh, just one more question from the audience. From my college brothers? Anything? <laughs> Don't let your old head outshine. <laughs> I'm talking about brothers a lot. Is that it? I appreciate all you guys coming out. Thank you. Again, thank you all for coming. <laughs> thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, if anyone has not seen the exhibit upstairs yet, uh, we're going to do another walkthrough. So anybody wants to join in, come and see it. Um, but also, with all these D9 folks in here, can we get a picture outside in uh, the area? I think that'd be pretty cool. So, uh, yes. <laughs> so again, thank you all for coming out. Uh, happy Black History Month. And <laughs>